I'm Dave Morgan. I'm the Vice Dean for Research in the School of Medicine at UCSF, and I have the great pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Evelyn Hernandez, who uh, is a graduate student in the Tetrad Graduate Program in Basic Science at UCSF. Evelyn uh, got her bachelor's degree at UCLA uh, back in 2018 in the, with a major of biochemistry and then came to UCSF thereafter to, to join the Tetrad program, continuing her work in biochemical problems. Um, she's also a Ford Foundation and Discovery Fellow. And it's also worth mentioning that she's the, the child of immigrants from the, the wonderful state of Jalisco in Mexico. And so she's also very interested in outreach and mentorship of of students from historically marginalized, marginalized backgrounds. And so today we're gonna to hear, be hearing about her exciting work on uh, uh, signaling mechanisms in the cell, essentially how cells talk to each other and how they interpret their communications. So without further ado, Evelyn, it's all yours. Hello, and thank you all for coming. I am doing my thesis work in the Aranejar lab where we study these amazing protein receptors named G-protein coupled receptors or GPCRs. And these receptors exist in the surfaces of our cells, uh, just shown in like as shown on this cartoon here, as well as other internal structures of the cell that are called organelles, such as this GPCR that is sitting here at the Golgi apparatus. And the particular GPCR that I'm interested in is called the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, hence the title of my presentation. And it has two residences in the cell, which you can see in the figure above here of a real cell that contains the beta-1 adrenergic receptor with its red border here denoting its plasma membrane localization and this little nub inside uh, denoting its Golgi uh, localization. And I'll be telling you a little bit about um, the importance of this compartmentalized signaling during my talk today. And this spinning curly thing here is a model of an individual beta-1 receptor at the molecular level. So it's a video of a single beta-1 receptor, which would measure only a few nanometers. And here in this border, in this cell, you would have hundreds, maybe thousands of these receptors uh, present. So before I jump into more of the science portion of my talk, I want to introduce myself a little bit more to you all, just so you get to know the person who's about to spew some data at you. And I'm doing this because I think it's important to know a bit more of the background of people who are in the privileged positions, such as I am, to conduct science and dictate where scientific advancements are going for the world, really, or the country, at least. And especially since recently during the COVID pandemic, there you know, was some lack of trust from the public towards the scientific community, which, you know, given the way that things were handled was, you know, a little bit understandable, especially for communities of color who have been victims of research and medical malpractices in the past. So as they mentioned, I graduated from UCLA, I'm now at UCSF. My parents are immigrants from a very rural town in Jalisco, Mexico, where at the time, they didn't have access to an education past middle school. So I'm um, the first generation high school undergrad and grad school student. And I grew up in Azusa, California, which is part of LA County, and it's a predominantly Latin American community. So I always felt at home and with family and was able to speak both English and Spanish with, with most of my friends at school. But our school district was massively underfunded, so quite a few of the schools I attended don't exist anymore. Uh, my high school closed just last year. Uh, we also didn't have very many fancy AP classes, nor did we have IB or any fun, you know, cool clubs. <laughs> we just did the best we could with the resources we had. And that's honestly just been my whole life, you know, being a child of immigrants as well, which is a great skill to have as a scientist because nothing's ever handed to you. You've really got to work hard and fail a lot and not give up easily. Um, but the thing is, even though resilience is a great attribute to have as a scientist, a lot of students from these communities aren't always as lucky as I am, uh, you know, to uh, make it out. And it's why we have situations such as these where Latin Americans are widely underrepresented in pursuing doctorate programs such as I am. And the numbers are even worse for the black community, especially given the percentages in the US population, um, if you see that bar at the top. And here in this box is where my category falls under the life sciences. And as we can see with the numbers and comparing them to the US population, we can see that we really are missing out on a lot of talent that can be coming from historically marginalized populations. 
And these trends start quite early in the educational journey if we see the percentage of Latina over here and Latinos here who have less than a high school education, it is five times more than their white counterparts. So of course, when we look at the percentages of college graduates, we see only about half Latinas and Latinos receiving college degrees than their white counterparts. And if we break this down even further in terms of how far in their college education these populations go, so we take these yellow bars from up here and break, in the, break them down further to associate, bachelor's, and graduate degrees, we see only about a third of Latina and Latino graduate college graduates going to graduate school compared to white women and men. So if we have less Latin Americans graduating from high school, we'll of course see less college graduates and even less pursuing advanced degrees. So of course, this is going to manifest itself into the workforce. So Latin Americans make up only 6% of the STEM workforce and Latinas only 2%. So that's what I'm gonna be hopefully adding to um, after I graduate. And this is something we see some, uh, I mean, everywhere in STEM. Um, it's just those leaky pipelines as we hear quite often where although we are improving the amount of undergraduate and graduate students that are from historically marginalized communities, we are losing a lot of great talent at the postdoctoral and faculty level where we still have a lot of these disparities. And not only is this pronounced with race and ethnicity, uh, but it's also pronounced with gender where we see women representation declining as careers advance. So, you know, how did I manage to get here? Um, well, as Han Solo said, never tell me the odds, but in all seriousness, it really has taken a village. I've had great mentors in the forms of professors, program administrators, et cetera, but also the community of Latin American scientists that I've been able to connect with has really gotten me through, as well as affinity groups like SACNAS, and also just always being proud of where I come from has helped me get here. And of course, there remains so much to be fixed in these spaces to fix historic marginalization. The environment and culture in big institutions, you know, can be a little hostile at times. And it's maybe one of the reasons why diverse people leave institutions as we move on through our careers. And even when people from the institution do want to listen or learn, the burden ends up uh, to explain the harm that is done to you know, students, trainees and faculty of color falls back on them. And it is real emotional labor. And you know, you may ask, why is this important to have representation in science and medicine? Well, Latin Americans are the second fastest growing population in the US and we need doctors that understand the community more to meet the demands of that rate. And people who come from these communities are of course going to be the ones that understand it more. And additionally, a lot of the medical and scientific research used to assess illness and disease is centered around data from sample sizes with majority white populations. So we also need researchers and PhDs that know to prioritize these aspects of society in their research. And one of the easiest ways that happens is with increased representation because people care about the things that affect them. So we need good representation of all populations in these power pos positions such as doctors and scientists so that everyone is accounted for in this country and this only improves our overall patient care for everybody. So what have I personally done to help try to improve these issues? So one thing I try to do is I specifically focus on mentoring students with similar backgrounds as me so that they can feel seen and you know they can feel like someone understands their issues inside and outside a lab and I really try to pay it forward because I also had help from older students in my community. And I've worked with UCSF in several ways to try to instill better practices, such as helping to add racism and science courses to our curriculum. I've worked with other underrepresented students and our Dean of Diversity and Student Learner Success to improve programming at the school so events are relevant to what we want to see. I um, mean, you've just gone to middle school and outreach, uh, uh, high school to do outreach. So, um, but, and it's all great, but you know, there can be a little bit of lack of support to do these types of things. You know, there's not always like real hired trained people to do the restorative and reparative work and that are able to effectively implement it. So the general trend has been for students who are already marginalized to do the work, which you know only takes our time away from the lab and contributes to the leaky pipelines. So as much as I've enjoyed doing all of these diversity and outreach type of activities, I've also had to take a step back and remember why I came to UCSF in the first place. And it's not to educate on these disparities, more so to inform that it isn't something to be easily dismissed, the fact that I can be here right now to give this lecture. More importantly, I came to UCSF to study science and work with one of the most supportive people I've had a privilege to be mentored by, which is my PhD advisor, Dr. Ranajad. 
So I really do feel fortunate to have been invited to speak to you all today and have my voice and my work uplifted and the work of the lab of Dr. Ranajad, of course, uplifted. So thank you for listening to that. And with that, I'll just start my science presentation. So before I go into too much of it, just want to explain that the type of work I do is what is referred to as basic science. So just to get everyone on the same page, a definition I found online that I liked and will use to explain what basic science can mean is typically basic science research focuses on determining the causal mechanisms behind the functioning of the human body in health and illness and use, utilizes hypothesis-driven experimental designs that can be specifically tested and revised. Once these fundamental principles of the biologic process, processes are understood, these discoveries can be applied or translated into direct application to patient care. So basic research isn't necessarily something that has an immediate impact or effect in the clinic, but it is conducted with the full intention that these basic discoveries will eventually be translated to the clinic and they inform a lot of the things that are directly translated to the clinic. Just to give a very basic and oversimplified introduction, evolutionary, we all evolved from single cell organisms such as these little bugs to the left, but over time, cells began to buddy up and start creating multicellular platforms, which became tissues such as these in the middle. And then we were able to form organs and organ systems to then creating complicated organisms such as us. And given that our bodies are made up of trillions of cells and these cells must communicate so that, for example, if you want to wiggle your toes, a signal from our brain can reach our feet so that you can produce the motion. So to do this, rapid cell-to-cell -cell communication became very essential for the survival of multicellular organisms. And one of the ways in which cells can communicate with one another is via receptors that exist on cell surfaces or plasma membranes called G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs for short. And I'm gonna I keep referring to them as GPCRs from now on. And their role in the cell is to act as kind of like microscopic radio towers in that it receives signals from the outside environment through activators or drugs and transmit this signal in the form of a biological response. In a similar way that a radio tower receives audio and video signals from the outside env environment to then transmit those signals and broadcast them to the public. And these cell surface receptors, the GPCRs, they have several different types across the body that control several functions such as smell, sight, pain, brain, and heart functions, and many more. I will fill up an entire slide with all of their functions and maybe a few more. Um, because these receptors are responsible for so many functions in our bodies, 35% of FDA-approved drugs target GPCRs. So they are a really big concern for physicians, patients, and pharmacologists, as GPCR signaling can malfunction and can, can lead to disease at times. So GPCRs have, like I mentioned in the beginning, they have residences in multiple locations on the cell. So here we're looking at a simple diagram of a generic cell. And some locations that GPCRs are known to exist are the cell surface or the plasma membrane, um, as well as other organelles that live inside of the cell, such as endosomes and the Golgi apparatus. And the way these receptors work is, if we can picture the mainland United States as a cell, and the border states represent the plasma membrane. The inland states then represent the internal organelles, so the landlocked states, right? And the GPCRs are like radio towers scattered across the United States, uh, receiving outside signals that, again, transmit and broadcast messages to the rest of the country. And the border towers represent the cell surface GPCRs. And the inland radio towers are the internal organelle GPCRs. So here I am showing you a zoomed version of our simple cell diagram to explain that the previous hypothesis on how GPCRs functioned was that GPCRs could only signal from the cell surface and that the internal GPCRs were silent or dormant. So the original thought was that signals that become activated with GPCR stimulation at the cell surface would then have to travel through longer distances in the cell to relay their messages so that other places in the cell, such as the nucleus, that is technically closer to other organelles, could get that signal. So longer distances would have to be traveled. So if we go back to our map analogy, it was as if only the border radio towers could read messages, and then the Pony Express would have to relay those messages to the rest of the country, which 
as we can imagine, can be quite inefficient, especially if we're carrying very important news. However, through the work that has been done over the last decade by our lab and others, we've recently discovered that internal GPCRs can signal as well, so they're not silent. So all of the radio towers in the country, including the inland states like Nevada, Colorado, and Kansas, quickly receive and transmit these messages. And in cells, this becomes important because it creates the opportunity to have two separate signaling phases that can potentially control different outputs due to the location of the GPCR and express in its proximity to certain parts of the cell, such as, like I mentioned, the nucleus, where our genetic material is stored, um, our DNA. So in our lab, we've actually shown that uh, endosomal and Golgi signaling can cause different genes to be expressed than the cell surface signaling. And one idea has been due, like I mentioned, the proximity or the localizations of these organelles with respect to the nucleus. So targeting the internal pool of GPCRs can lead to very different effects and this becomes crucial when it comes to deciphering which pool of GPCRs might be more responsible for causing disease and designing drugs that target the appropriate pool. So we call this signaling from internal cellular compartments or organelles compartmentalized signaling because it's a signal that is coming from a compartment in the cell. So I'm focusing on the Golgi because my project focuses on the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which is a GPCR that is expressed highly in heart cells and has cell surface and Golgi localizations. And one of its main functions is to be activated by epinephrine, better known as adrenaline, in order for heart muscles to contract and relax. And there are two types of beta adrenergic receptors that are expressed in heart cells, and both regulate the activity of a very important protein uh, named adenylocyclase, which I'm gonna talk about later in the presentation in more detail. But one important fact to know is that Beta-1 makes up the majority of beta adrenergic receptors in heart cells, where it makes up about 80% of the receptors and the remaining 20% is beta-2. And another thing, another interesting thing to note is the different localization patterns of beta-1 and beta-2 in real heart cells. So here are isolated heart cells in which beta-1 is localized at the plasma membrane region, so kind of all around the cell. And in these regions that we call perinuclear regions, which is where the Golgi resides. Uh, whereas the beta-2 does not have any uh, localization around the nucleus, just on the plasma membrane. So now I want to show you how it was discovered that this intracellular pool of beta-1 um, can act, be activated and signal. And I will tell you about the approach that our lab takes to directly look at this activation. So in our lab, we utilize the technique of microscopy quite extensively. So in order to physically visualize the receptors being activated with a microscope, we attached a green fluorescent protein. So a protein that glows green when you excite it with a particular wavelength uh, to a special type of antibody that's called the nanobody, which is a smaller version. This is the nanobody in blue, and this is a human antibody. It's a smaller version than um, our human antibodies, and they're made in very specific species and animals, such as llamas and sharks. Um, and the top part of these smaller special antibodies, this variable domain, what we call it, um, they're engineered to trap the active state of receptors so that you know certain scientists that are called structural biologists could study the uh, what makes the activated shape of the receptor is so special or different from the inactive shape. And the reason we need to engineer these to trap the active state is because the active state of GPCRs is very uh, transient when it's uh, you know by itself, when it's in a purified form. So they needed to really get something that would trap this structure so that they could study it. So for our, uh, in our purposes, we take this nanobody, like I mentioned, we attach a protein that glows green, so that we could create a biosensor that only interacts with our GPCR when it is activated. And we're, so that we're able to visually track this. And here I will show you what that looks like because I can stand that was like pretty hard to visualize. Um, just to orient you, here I'm showing you a, a single cell expressing the beta-1 energic receptor. I do not have a label, so you can't see it here, but the Golgi is labeled in red. So these three are the same cell, just different panels. The Golgi is labeled in red, um, the right is merged, and 
as I mentioned in the previous slide, the nanobody is labeled in green, right? And here it appears you know, diffuse and spread out throughout the cell prior to stimulation. But when the receptor, uh, when the activ activator is added, we can see the nanobody is quickly recruited to the cell surface. And then after some time, we also start seeing the recruitment of the nanobody at the Golgi, which is denoted with the white arrowheads. And on this side, we can see the nice overlap of that. So what is the significance to the cell's signaling response at a different compartment? So there was a previous conundrum where it was not understood why heart drugs that could not cross the cell surface were less effective than drugs that could cross the cell surface. And the reason why this was a conundrum before was because like I mentioned before, internal signaling at GPCR was not thought to occur. But now we know that these drugs are crossing the cell surface and they're having access to that extra uh, pool of resident Golgi beta-1. So the drug has you know, access to both compartments and not just the plasma membrane. So now we may ask what is happening at the Golgi in heart cells that makes its targeting so significant. So you know, one question is, are the signals even that different? So uh, the responses are, in fact, different for beta-1 at the plasma membrane and at the Golgi for heart cells. So in our lab, we have just very recently shown that the cell surface beta-1 seems to contract, uh, I mean, seems to control the contraction response, while the Golgi beta-1 control the relaxation response. And this was quite interesting because in certain heart failure diseases, it appears that what is going wrong is actually the relaxation part of the heartbeat and not the contraction response. And another lab a couple a few years ago showed that hypertension uh, phenotypes uh, or hypertrophy phenotypes, sorry, there's a typo, typo there. It can be caused by the overactivation of specifically Golgi beta-1. So if we can find a way to specifically target this receptor pool that is causing the pathological effects, that would be great for the cardiovascular field and heart patients that struggle with the you know, less effective drugs. The next question that came up for us is how is this compartmentalized signaling regulated? So in other words, how does a cell make sure there is no cancellation of effects or excessive redundancy or that the right cellular responses are being activated at the right space and time? Are there different proteins interacting with beta-1 at each compartment? So before I dive into that, I want to give a little bit more background on the GPCRs. So as the name of the receptor implies, G protein coupled receptor, these receptors interact with or couple to proteins that live inside the cell named G proteins. And these G proteins function kind of like radio tower technicians for our tiny radio towers, where they help fine tune and transmit the signal so that the correct message is interpreted by the cell. And depending on the type of GPCR that is activated and the type of G protein that the receptor couples to, because there are there's many flavors of G proteins in the cell, uh, different types of signaling cascades can occur that produce oh, just a wide range of biological responses. And there are some receptors, however, that are a little bit more you know, promiscuous and can couple to more than one G protein type. So for example, this receptor here couples to GS, where the S stands for stimulatory, as well as the GI protein, where the I stands for inhibitory, which allows the cells to either increase or decrease cyclic AMP levels by either stimulating or inhibiting this very important protein that I mentioned earlier named adenylocyclase. And cyclic AMP is a small molecule. It's um, like ATP or, you know, ATP, I'm sure people have heard about it. It's our energy currency of the cell, but adenylocyclase then takes this ATP and uh, converts it into what we call cyclic AMP. And this is a very important uh, molecule uh, in the, for signaling in the cell. So the GS protein helps increase its uh, concentration in the cell and GI helps decrease it. So if we go back to our radio tower analogy, the G proteins are kind of acting like rival radio tower technicians where some are on a mission to help the radio tower send the message and the others are on a mission to destroy the message. 
And the receptor that I'm interested in, beta-1, has been much more widely studied in the context of its ability to couple to GS, but using very powerful microscopes, like I mentioned, that can visually track proteins that interact with one another, my research has shown that, unlike previously reported, the beta-1 receptor can couple to GS, uh, up to GI, uh, and not just GS. So in order to figure this out, to decipher this, like I mentioned, you know, I use those powerful microscopes and I'm taking advantage of these tools called Mini-G. Um, uh, and we call these Mini-G because they consist of only the region of G proteins that interact with the receptor. So they're usually a lot bigger, but for the purposes of making this probe, it's made a lot smaller. Um, and similar to the nanobody, we've seen other labs use the Mini-G like here on the left, for uh, structural purposes, to, so to study the shape of these proteins. But again, we attach a fluorescent protein to the mini-G, and we can then visualize recruitment in live cells using a microscope. And again, this recruitment only happens uh, to activate a receptor. And one thing to know is that this was uh, different than the nanobody, because the nanobody, again, there's, there are these engineered uh, parts of these antibodies, right, that are made to be specific for your receptor. And what I wanted to know was if these little proteins that exist endogenously or naturally in the cells, do they both, do, you know, they both couple to my receptors? So I really needed to use something that wasn't um, engineered to be specific for my receptor. So here I have images of cells on the left. And in magenta, we have beta-1. And next to it in yellow, I have the mini GS uh, probe. And in yellow on the far right, I have the mini GI. And as we can see in time equals zero, uh, before I add drug, both mini G probes are you know, nicely diffused throughout the cell. And then when I stimulate after some time, we can see that the mini GS is nicely recruited to the plasma membrane first. And then after some more time, we see that the mini GI is recruited a little bit later and takes a little longer and it's a little more subtle. And we can see that on the right over here with um, in graph form. So the blue, dark blue line represents mini GS and the red line is mini GI. And again, going back to that radio tower analogy, it's as if the blue radio tower technicians representing GS are better at climbing the radio tower than the orange technicians representing GI. They're only okay at climbing the radio tower. You know, and the next question that came up for me was, you know, why is that? And another fact that was very interesting to me was that when I performed image, all these imaging experiments and I would look at the Golgi compartment, um, I would only ever see recruitment at the Golgi of mini GS but not mini GI, as you can see over here. So this is mini GS, this is mini GI. So I, for the mini GI, I would only see subtle recruitment to the plasma member, but not the Golgi. So I was wondering what was so special about the plasma membrane that was helping mini GI couple there to beta one, or maybe on the flip side, what is it about the Golgi membrane missing that is not allowing mini GI to couple to beta one there? So I started thinking about the actual composition of the membranes at each of these compartments. And if you didn't know before, I wanted to point out that cell membranes are made up of phospholipids, which are these greasy, oily particles that help things that uh, help things that shouldn't be in the cell, you know, out, and it helps keep things inside of the cell. But there's another version of these lipids that are a little fancier, and they exist on, uh, and they're called uh, phosphoinositides. And more recently, they have been given their credit that they've been owed for their importance in membrane receptor signaling. And the plasma membrane is rich in a phosphoinositide named PIP2. And the Golgi membrane, which is the other location, again, that beta-1 lives in, is devoid of PIP2. And it is enriched in a different phosphoinositide named PI4P. So this got me thinking that, you know, maybe PIP2 at the plasma membrane helps GI couple to beta-1. And, you know, that wasn't just something that I came up with, you know, just, you know, had a dream about it or anything about it. The, the thought of phosphoinositides, especially, uh, specifically PIP2, playing a role in GPCR signaling and G protein coupling is not new. Uh, but for the sake of, you know, time and confusing you all more because this is all very uh, technical stuff, I'm not going to show you the breadth of the past papers and labs that have highlighted these molecules' importance. So for now, just have to trust me. 
After confirming that beta one can couple to both GS and GI based on those mini G tools and you know, going through some literature, we had this hypothesis that maybe PIP2 molecules that are living at the plasma membrane, maybe they're stabilizing the receptor in an active conformation long enough so that the GI can couple. And we think that these molecules help GI bind because like I showed you, it couples a little more weakly to the receptor than GS. So, and there is no coupling at the Golgi, right? So the idea is that these phosphodinositides help the receptor stay in a stable and active conformation long enough so that the GI has the chance to bind. But before we go into the data, I just want to explain that, you know, always taking it back to the analogy so that I don't lose too many people. So it's as if, again, the blue technicians, their GS protein, they're really good at climbing the radio tower and they're so good at it that they don't even need a harness to climb. You know, don't try this at home. But the orange technicians representing the GI protein, like I mentioned, they're only okay at climbing radio towers and they really need a harness to be able to get up there. And the harness, of course, represents PIP2 in this analogy. So to test whether my hypothesis is correct or not, the most straightforward way to do this is to remove the harness from the orange guys and then see if they can still climb up the tower. So how do I go about removing cellular harnesses, right? That's a difficult thing to do. Um, so to do that and to test whether PIP2 had an effect in dual coupling, what I did was deplete PIP2 from the plasma membrane by using a system that has been wide or a technique that's been widely used in cell biology for many decades. It's called the FKBP FRB rapamycin system. And what happens here, you don't really need to remember the name or anything for you to understand. So I specifically target a fragment of a protein and this fragment is the FKBP fragment. And I target this, I tether it, I put a little biological anchor and I tethered it to the plasma membrane. And cytosolically, so unattached, I express the other fragment of this protein called F, the FRB fragment. And these two fragments have a super high affinity for each other when they're in the presence of this molecule named rapamycin. So without rapamycin, they're apart, but when you add rapamycin, they really like to um, stick to each other. So to this FRB fragment, what I've done is patched a phosphatase, which is an enzyme that chews up phosphoinositides. And specifically the phosphatase I chose was one that would specifically chew up the PIP2. Below here, I have a cell that is expressing this whole system. So the, all these fragments, and it's also expressing this PIP2 marker. So just like a, a dye pretty, or not a dye, but like, yeah, a, a little marker that binds to PIP2 at the plasma membrane. So the idea is when we add rapamycin, these guys come together, the phosphatase is recruited to the plasma membrane, and the phosphatase is then able to chew up the phospho um, inositide or PIP2 into uh, a different molecule, right? And we can see that the edges of this PIP2 marker in the after scene are a lot more depleted. It's never 100% perfect. That's uh, almost an impossible ask for cell biologists, but you know it's enough for us to test what we want to see, uh, which is the recruitment of the mini G probes. So here I, on the left side, I'm comparing the mini GS curves. So the dark blue line is the same line I showed you earlier with the imaging panel. So here for the sake of you know space and to not confuse you, I'm not showing you pictures of cells. I'm just gonna show you the graft data. So in the dark blue line, again, it's the same curve I showed you for mini GS um, being recruited to beta one in the normal conditions. And in teal, just behind it is uh, mini GS recruited to beta one when PIP2 has been depleted. And as we can see, uh, you know, we can see that, you know, mini GS can obviously still bind. So it's not really depending much on PIP2 for its recruitment because we don't see this curve, you know, fall or be extremely, you know, delayed or anything like that. But when we compare the mini GI probe with beta one in the regular conditions in red up here, which is again, the same curve I showed you earlier, except you know it was this blue one and red together, but now you know, I'm comparing them differently. Uh, this is mini GI with beta one in regular conditions and the orange is mini GI with PIP2 depleted. And I think it's you know 
kind of pretty obvious that when we deplete PIP2, we see this abrogation of mini GI recruitment. And to me, that was suggesting that PIP2 may be providing a much bigger stabilizing role for GI coupling than for GS, since it seems like you know, mini GS has a strong enough affinity for beta one to defy the depletion of PIP2. But, you know, it was eliminated for mini GI when PIP2 was depleted. So we wanted to confirm that these ideas were reflected in functional data. So all of the stuff I've been showing you, that's all in, you know, in cells, it's all, you know, we're, you know, picking cells that are expressing what, you know, we want them to, and, and you know, we're, we're seeing recruitment, but, you know, what, what is being recruited there, you're, all you're really seeing is, you know, two proteins coming together and touching each other, right? That's really great information, but you always have to back that up with some functional data. So you want to see the downstream effector. So what comes after those two proteins touching each other, is that actually happening, right? So I performed an experiment that measures the increase in GS signaling by detecting that molecule that I mentioned earlier, cyclic AMP. And again, cyclic AMP comes from ATP and it is converted to you know, this form by adenylocyclase, this enzyme that is either activated by GS signaling or it's inhibited by GI signaling. So I wanted to see, do we see an increase in cyclic AMP when we deplete PIP2? Because if we don't, then you know, maybe what we're seeing isn't you know, real. But you know, it was really awesome to see that when I performed this experiment, I saw that PIP2 depleted cells did produce more cyclic AMP. And I'm showing that here in the teal curve than cells expressing beta-1 in normal condi conditions in dark blue. And we see this increase, you know, going up. So again, you know, we're going back to the radio tower analogy, um, you know, always want to bring it back to the metaphors. <laughs> it's like, you know, we thought in the beginning, the blue technicians representing GS don't need that harness or that PIP2 to climb the tower, aka don't need PIP2 to couple to beta-1. But the orange technicians do need a harness to climb the tower, aka GI needs PIP2 to couple to beta-1. And we see this because when we get rid of the harness for the orange guys, they aren't able to go up the radio tower anymore, right? Like GI is not coupling to beta one anymore after we take PIP2 away. And thus they're not able to silence that radio tower's message. So we get an overstimulation or an over amplification of the radio tower signal. And that's what we're seeing in this piece of data here. And if you remember from what I told you earlier, the imaging experiments have shown that GS can couple to beta-1 at both the plasma membrane and Golgi, but GI can only couple to beta-1 at the plasma membrane. As in, you know, again, just want to make sure everyone gets it, the only membrane in the cell that has the pips, aka the harness that is needed to climb the tower. Because, you know, Golgi, no PIP2, no harness, no GI coupling. And if we take this one step further, if you also remember from, you know, a lot earlier, from our recent findings and those of other labs, we have seen that it, it's the overactivation of the Golgi pool of beta-1 specifically that might be leading to some diseases. And you know, how is that tying into what I'm studying? Well, again, the plasma membrane, it's the pool that couples, I mean, sorry, the Golgi, it's the pool of beta-1 that couples only to GS and not GI. Therefore, what I'm thinking is occurring is that there's no regulation there that brings a signal down or gets rid of excessive signals like we're seeing at the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane beta one can couple to GS and GI. So even if there was were to be, you know, some kind of overstimulation of GS or whatever, GI can come in and, you know, help get rid of some of those extra cyclic AMPs that are um, floating around or, you know, being created um, or suppress that signal back down. But you know, at the Golgi, we're just getting that over amplification of messages coming from just one compartment. And you know, maybe that's due to the ability of GI able to couple to beta one at the plasma membrane because of that PIP2. And you know, just to relate this to other things, I talked earlier a little bit about beta two. And you know, these two receptors are very highly related. They have some very similar sequences. So I really just wanted to go uh, one step further and see if um, this was something that was happening to other GPCRs. And we are seeing the same thing. So again, the top line, the teal line is beta two, 
with PIP2 depleted. And we see that there is an increase in cyclic AMP even a little more drastically actually than you know, the normal cells. And again, this is the mini GS curves being compared. Um, this curve is a little lower just because beta two has a diff slightly different behavior than beta one, but um, this peak here shows it's coupling to GS. And when you deplete PIP2, it's a little delayed, but it still happens later. But we see the loss of that recruitment with mini GI uh, when PIP2 is depleted, but you know we, we see it being recruited in the normal situations. I went through that a little quickly, but um, some conclusions and future directions and some other thoughts. Just to summarize, what I hope I could get across is that some GPCRs have residences inside of the cell and not just the cell surface. They can be activated at these internal residences to produce distinct and very important, and sometimes you know, later on in life or due to overstimulation can cause you know, pathological, biological processes. And some GPCRs can couple to more than one G protein type. And at least for the beta adrenergic receptors, this seems to be possible due to the stability that PIP2 provides for GI. And this gives the ability, the receptors the ability to control their signaling by, for example, negative feedback loops that exist exclusively in one of its residing compartments. And for some future directions that can be asked for future graduate students, I've kind of started answering some of these questions, but as I mentioned, I'm finishing my fifth year. So, you know, it's things have to be, the knowledge has to be passed on to the, the young generations. Um, but one of the big questions is, is relevant to other receptors other than the beta adrenergic family. Um, but even within the beta adrenergic family, I was doing all of these experiments in, you know, more generic cells. It would be cool to, you know, take it one step further and uh, see if, these kinds of phenomena are holding true in real heart cells, which is where the receptors hold their most uh, clinical significance. And a lot of people in the lab actually do uh, mouse, mouse work with uh, heart cells. So that's definitely a question that can be answered within the next couple of years in our lab. Um, and, you know, of course, um, how can we use this to help, you know, improve beta blocker drug design? Um, but again, one thing I want to just kind of throw out there as well before I go into the questions is that, you know, I talked about and zone in on the beta-1 adrenergic receptor because that's what I'm doing my PhD on. That's um, what I'm in interested in. Um, but there is lots more evidence for compartmentalized signaling. You know, from one of the, the first pioneering papers in the field, which was led by my current faculty mentor, Roshana Kiranijad, in 2013, she first devised, uh, she was the one who devised that nanobody biosensor uh, to show that beta-2 could signal from its internal pool at these organelles called the endosomes. And then, you know, there's more recent emerging papers from our lab included that show that the dopamine 1 receptor could signal from its Golgi and endosomal locations, as well as another recent paper from one of Roshanak's uh, colleagues where they show that the mu opioid receptor being able to signal from the Golgi as well. And this new information regarding the compartmentalized signaling for all of these very important receptors is crucial because as I've shown you today, um, you know, for the beta one receptor, it's got huge implications in heart, but so does beta two. Um, also beta two, you know, big in uh, smooth, smooth muscle tissue and lungs. Um, and these other two receptors, as you know, I think most these are, you know, very, you know, known receptors, uh, they're highly implicated in the brain and certain, you know, just normal functions, but also neurological disorders such as depression, anxiety, addiction, and these discoveries that um, we can hopefully see make a big impact in the medical field in the next decade or so have all been due to the basic science research. So just want to remind you that the target GPCR, uh, that the drugs that target GPCRs make up about 35% of FDA approved drugs. So improving these therapies can be a really big game changer. So, you know, I hope I was able to convince you all of the importance of zooming into the mechanisms of how biology really works. You know, although it can be a little tedious and reductive sometimes, but it really does inform just mechanistically how are things working. So with that, I'm just just want to quickly thank my lab, uh, UCSF, my fellowships and, every, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Blake and Dr. Morgan and Don, of course, um, and, you know, everyone who's helped me uh, guide me through my time at UCSF. And with that, I will take questions now. 
Okay, thank you very much, Evelyn. That was lovely. One thing that I'm curious about is these internal receptors, once they reach the Golgi, they're still active. So they must still be bound to their activating drug or neurotransmitter or whatever. So does mm -hmm. that drug or neurotransmitter go with them into the interior or are there other signaling mechanisms? Yeah, that's always a great question to get because it's one that I know the answer to. <laughs> um, so at least so for, for the beta receptors, like I mentioned before, the endogenous drug for uh, our activator for our receptors is epinephrine. And there are these transporters or these kind of they're transporters or not channels or transporters called organic cation transporters that are help shuttle these uh, these um, molecules in. So for beta one, the transporter is OCT3 and Roshana was also, that was her second paper in 2017 from her postdoc in Mark's lab. So that was uh, where she found out that, you know, in certain cell types that don't express this transporter, they would she wouldn't see Golgi stimulation, but in the cell types that did express OCT3, you would see that stimulation at the Golgi. And it was really cool to then when, you know, taken a step further, the OCT3 was also very highly present and expressed in heart cells. So it, you know, it kind of corroborated that. And for the dopamine receptor, it's OCT2. So that's the transporter um, that, is uh, helping shuttle that in. And at least for OCT2, I believe there are, um, they, there are some of those transporters like in the Golgi region. So that helps bring that in. OCT3, it's kind of around the perinuclear region. So there's, it's kind of unsure exactly how the drug maybe is getting trafficked and reaching the, the internal region of the Golgi lumen, but um, that's the information that's out there right now. Oh, and I guess you showed a few, you showed an opioid receptor and a dopamine receptor at the end there. So the same sort of thing must be going on there. Transport. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm not entirely sure for uh, which one it would be for the opioid receptor, but it would be, you know, really cool to mm -hmm. <laughs> look into that as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that um, in the world of GPCR signaling and actually in signaling in general, whenever whenever a cell is being bombarded with some signal and transmitter or drug or whatever it likes to uh, adapt to those high concentrations mm -hmm. of of stimulus and and turn itself off to some extent or through negative feedback or whatever and so i guess one way of looking what you're at what you're doing is essentially a form of adaptation in these cells where they they turn on gs initially to turn on a signal and then mm -hmm. I, I later to turn it off um mm -hmm. that's that's a that's one approach. Um, what are some of the? Why don't you tell the crowd some of the other? There's there's another really important adaptation mechanism, which is internalization of receptors and their destruction, and that obviously is a great way to turn it off. But that doesn't seem to be happening here. Or what's the deal? So for beta one, it doesn't get internalized very readily because at its C terminal tail, it doesn't really have those phosphorylation sites that would get phosphorylated by GRKs, which are you know the kinases or the ones that attach those tags to the receptor. Mm -hmm. And those tags are, I mean, the signaling world is always a cascade, right? So one protein comes in, does something, and then another protein comes in and does another thing. So what those little tags do is recruit another protein named arrestin and arrestin would then help um, you know engulf a, a whole vesicle to the internal of the cell which is called that's the endosome so that was one of the things i was talking about earlier too where uh, beta 2 and dopamine they are readily endocytosed they do have those sites at its tail that you know help them get phosphorylated and then uh, shuttle into endosomes and that was also the idea before where you know endosomes the receptors at the endosomes they're silent they're usually on their way to either you know go back to the plasma membrane to be recycled without their activator anymore or they would go you know be created uh they'd be shuttled or transformed into you know lysosomes and then get degraded but that was what Rashanik's first paper with beta 2 was about how she was able to show that beta 2 at these compartments was also still potentially activated as well. And a lot of those endosomal signals are also inducing different transcriptional responses because if you do block endocytosis from the plasma membrane after activation, you won't get the same responses uh, transcriptionally from the nucleus. 
So you really do need some of that cyclic AMP that's being generated from the internal pools to turn on some switches that normally wouldn't, unless you have such a sustained response from the plasma membrane of cyclic AMP that like the cyclic AMP just leaks out because, you know, it's all, it, there's those phosphodiesterases or cyclic AMP eaters, they are kind of tethered across the membrane and they like to just keep cyclic AMP nice and tight around where it's supposed to be. But of course, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, disease settings as life mm -hmm. goes on, things don't turn off the way they are supposed to. And sometimes that causes that overstimulation. Obviously, you're doing a lot of this work in cultured cells of uh, mm -hmm. what sort of cells were they? Uh, human cells, uh, mouse These cells? Were, they were HeLa cells, so human okay. cells, but you know, very uh, non-specific at this point. Yep. Very generic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was. I was sitting here thinking about because I saw the time courses in a lot of your experiments, and a lot of these things were happening over periods of minutes. A lot of these changes yeah. in going from GS to GI and so on. And that's not something that's going to happen in a heart cell between a heartbeat because obviously it would take too long. Yeah, yeah, it would take too long. Yeah, so what's what is the relevance of this to a, an actual heart cell where epinephrine, for example, is being dumped on a heart cell, causing it to contract more strongly? Yeah, so that is why we tend to sometimes use like a pretty high concentration of drug in our dishes. So we use the 10 micromolar so we are at least saturating the receptors which is um sometimes a caveat you know because you know but i mean when hearts are going when you, you are a fight or flight response you are <laughs> very concentrated in adrenaline but um yeah no i think that is always a, a good point but which is why it will be important to you know take this one step further into the heart cells and really probe for those downstream signals in uh GI. Uh, and one cool thing that we could actually do that, probably um, a former postdoc in the lab had set up this like zebrafish system where uh, we targeted like uh, these optogenetic tools or these tools that can be activated by light. And then uh, we, we targeted like an aden a bacterial adenylyl cyclase that can just create cyclic AMP on the go at the plasma membrane versus the Golgi. So hopefully we can activate, you know, fine tune the two signals and see if, you know, in certain real animals or, you know, mouse cells, we see uh, the, the actual GI signaling happening in real cells. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's always a place to start. Um, I think there are those caveats as well. And it's the one saving grace I always have is because we took a lot of our hypotheses and ideas from structural papers. So a lot of these ideas, that you know, beta one's doing this with these G proteins potentially because of this, you know, harness. Um, mm -hmm. We all took that from a lot of biochemical and structural data. People that were doing this work in purified systems. So we thought we were being more biologically relevant, right, by putting it in cells. And you know, there's always one more step to do it to get closer to you know real applications. So that's obviously the next step to make sure that this is all sound. Um, we have a related question from one of our attendees, which is, you mentioned heart cells, but uh, are all these mechanisms related to other cell types as well? So where else, where else, you kind of mentioned that at the end, where else might this happen as well? Yeah, so one of the things that we mentioned, or I mentioned, um, was the dopamine receptor, and actually it, the our paper from the lab, so former uh, graduate student, she just graduated, um, she showed that this is happening in real neurons. So she actually put the nanobody and the dopamine receptor in real mouse neurons. And she was able to see the compartmentalized signaling in that like, it was really cool to actually see because we didn't even think it'd be possible to be able to do that. So um, that's one of the best examples we have, especially putting it in a real cell. So that would be something to do next. And are, are those, I, like you kind of went mentioned this with regard to heart cells, but is it possible in a neuron and a mouse or places like that to use any of these cool tricks with the mini G proteins to see, or the nanobodies to see where the activation is occurring? Um, that, so that you can get at um, some of these mechanisms actually in a, in a mouse. Yeah, um, I think we would just have to get the right, uh, get the mini Gs and all of that in the right constructs and the right expression. Because if you start over expressing any of these uh, um, probes, you know, they have very high affinity for receptors. So you might actually end up 
causing like cell death because they actually end up blocking all signaling from the receptors. So you really have to fine tune the expression levels really well with those, but it is something to try. It would just be a very like long project. <laughs> Do you have any idea why PIP2 does what it does? Do we, is there structural? There's structural, issues? yeah. There is some really, cool, so in the last paper that I saw, it came out either end of last year, early this year, it was on the adenosine to a receptor, adrenergic receptor, uh, no, adenosine receptor, sorry, yeah. And it also has the dual coupling. And what it seemed to do was that, this is the one where I got like, I was so happy when it came out because I was like, wow, I'm not crazy. This might actually be happening. And it showed that the PIP2 would kind of, it, the GS would just come in and bind fine, but the PIP2 would kind of sit in like a region because PIP2 is very negative. It's a very negatively charged molecule. And it would kind of bind to a very positively charged region of the receptor, but it would sit in a region where the GI protein was going to come in and bind. So it, it was almost like holding the seat warm for it. So, mm -hmm. so in order to like keep it open for it, because otherwise it will just stay closed and the GI won't be able to get in there. So the PIP2 really would wedge itself in there, warmed up the seat and then let GI come in. Okay. Okay. Great. Perfect. Well, with that, I think uh, we can sign off and thanks again for a really fun presentation and all your passions, both in science and in your outreach activities as well. That's all awesome. So best of luck. Thank and you so much.